This week, we're here with my good friend, Eric Hortense. And I'm not just saying that, we really are close friends. Eric is from Streamline USA, and I've pretty much wanted to have you on the show for a few months now, and I'm finally able to do it. I'm happy to have you here. And we are sitting in one of your big projects. This is what, a 8,000 square foot townhouse? Yeah, 7,800 square feet. And what are you guys doing here? Like, what do they bring you into this townhouse for? Oh, so I get in early. Um, you know, my, my main focus is to work with the consultants. What's early, like 10 a.m., 9 a.m.? <laughs> yeah, uh, probably about six months before the project starts. That's about how long we usually estimate, guesstimate, uh, six to eight months by the time you actually have nails in the ground. Um, I get in early with the consultants. We work through all the design intent. You know, I'm, Consultants I'm, consist of? Uh, mechanical engineer, um, architects, interior designers, uh, special inspectors, <clears throat> all the people that are pertinent to the, to the project. Amazing. And so how much is this renovation going to cost when all is said and done? Uh, it's a little north of $5 million. Got it. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. Yeah. When you break it down per square foot, it's kind of, kind of sort of in the realm of about 600 to $700 a square foot. That's how we measure it out. Some areas are higher ticket, obviously, you know, with lots of millwork and stone. And then other areas, you know, utility, back of house, basement, you know, the values are less. But we average it out. Got it. And when you're doing a... Upper East Side, 7,800 square foot townhouse. Um, I'm assuming that the the client, the the I was gonna say the buyer. This I'm just triggered or uh, uh, um, program to just say the buyer. But uh, I guess the the client, yeah, uh, they want the best of the best. Yeah, well, I like to put us in a high end category for anything construction related. So uh, we have you know, two divisions right now, residential and commercial, and then our third division that we just started is property, ma property management. And this is who Streamline is. So my next question was gonna be to just tell me what is Streamline up to right now? Uh, so we're a mid-sized builder, and uh, you know, in Manhattan, that is kind of a broadband um, you know, statement because there's so much construction going on in so many different ways. Yeah. Uh, so being a mid-sized builder, it means that right now we have a little over 50 employees, um, and we're, executing projects right now we have a 96,000 square footer going on on Madison uh, we have two townhouses we have a wide range of apartments um, you know we have a, a new restaurant coming in in Columbus Circle that we're getting ready to hit go on and uh, how'd you get that job how are you now doing this new restaurant because you well it's all networking really at the end of the day um, right but you built what what did you uh, just build you built bad room you built bad room yeah yeah that's, that's no that's no small feat it's no small. It's over. It's an over ten thousand square foot restaurant. Yeah, in a related building, uh, you know, right in the middle of basically the center That's of the universe. Yeah, it's massive. Yeah, this is a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> so let's bring me back. Bring me back. Yeah. Where did this all begin? Because I know Streamline's been around for how long? Uh, this is fifteen years now. Um, Whew. Yeah, yeah. I was a I was a nightlife. Uh, you know, entrepreneur. I was a club director from the mid '90s. Let's go chronologically. So, yeah. what year are we talking? '96 uh, was my first club job in New York City. I, I started bar back in '93 in the Hamptons. Um, you know, that was my first exposure. But I actually got introduced to a nightclub that I started working in Twilo in 1996. Twilo in '96. Yeah. It was the beginning of it all. Sasha and Digweed was my party. I actually was the promoter of Sasha and Digweed. <laughs> That's taking me far back. back. <laughs> that is taking me back. Yeah. Yeah. So then what? You started working at Twilo in 96. Yeah. So there was a networking game back then too. It was, you know, how many people could you get on your guest list? Uh, and then once the numbers grew to a certain level, I started doing bookings and doing my own events. Uh, moved on to the Sound Factory in 1998. Uh, had a great run over there. I would like to think those are the best years of Sound Factory, 98 to 2000. I was a director. Um, so that meant I basically managed the floor on Fridays and Saturdays, which was, you know, there's over 100 employees. What's one then. of the craziest things you saw? And you could probably go down the list of thousands of things. <sighs> What's like something that stuck with you from that time at Sound Factory that you were able to remember it still today and kind of maybe had an impact on you? I mean, I have images in my mind of the theme parties that the owner used to do. He was just a really... He was, we called him a madman, but at the end of the day, he was very smart in the way he did it. He kept the club changing all the time. So there were a couple of theme parties that he did that were just way over the top, like the S&M party. Like he had like people hanging from chains with like fit hooks through their body and blood and everything. It was, I like, I remember the theme parties back then and, you know, turning the place into a winter wonderland for Christmas. And like, it was literally snowing in the club. 
Is so. any of this stuff able to be done nowadays to, to, at the level of which they did it? Uh, I think now today, because we're living in a digital era, it's a little different. Um, you know, people bring the screens now and they do their, you know, their themes are based on the screens. Uh, pyrotechnics are allowed somehow inside clubs I, or outside, you know, Mirage, uh, things like that. I, and I still to this day, I'm still blown away that we're able to get away with doing events outside because when I was in the business, that was a big no, no. Why? They, just noise was a big deal. Uh, we didn't have, they call them, uh, you know, temporary certificate of occupancies, TCOs. Uh, people are throwing events in warehouses and things like that. And I was innovative as a youngster. Uh, I went to college at West Virginia University. So we used to throw parties on campus with, you know, three, 4,000 people. So I kind of try to bring that element to New York in my club uh, history. And, and, you know, I got away with a few off-grid raves, I guess you want to call them, back in the day. And what did you do with the money that you were making from these raves? Well, you know, they were few and far between. So you kind of lived in the moment of being a success. And then that kind of led yeah. you to the next one. I and look then, at, uh, I was talking about this the other day, how, because in, in Arizona, I used to throw parties. Uh, once or twice a semester, I'm bringing a few hundred kids down to Mexico. And I'm renting, <laughs> I'm renting out a club in Nogales, Mexico. And I'm charging, you know, X amount for guys, X amount for girls, open bar, upstairs, we had a VIP where I'm selling bottles. <laughs> And you know, Same making thing. anywhere from uh, you know, four to ten thousand cash in a night. Yep. And why didn't I have someone? Hey, give me thirty percent of that. I'm gonna do something with it. Every party. Don't worry, you'll thank me later. Yeah, it's tough, especially when you're young. Yeah. You know, you find ways to spend money, vacations to go on, things like that. Um, I, I look back at my history and all the building blocks that took me to get where I am today. Um, every one of them was a component to where my mind works in my job. I have a degree in communications, uh, interpersonal organizational, and West Virginia University taught me how to be a networker, taught me how to be an organizer. Uh, I was a social chairman of my fraternity house, so we were throwing huge events and I was dealing with the cash and the sound systems. Yeah, but networking, it seems to be like that's in your blood. Being the social chair, being the, the yeah. charismatic guy, that's who you are. Yeah. So how did you transition from club life to contractor. I got to give a lot of that credit to my grandfather and my father. Amen. Um, what are their names? Well, my grandfather was Valentino and my dad was Robert, uh, Bobby on the streets in Jersey City. Um, is Bobby named after him? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. My nephew is Bobby, Love it. Bobby the third. My brother Bobby. is Robert Jr. There we go. So we have a lineage. Uh, we're from San Valentino, Abruzzo, Italy. And my grandfather came over here when he was you know, 14 years old and he worked. So he taught us how to work at a very right, young so age. Bobby Hortense, your nephew. Yeah. Uh, so I know the second is junior. Is the third a double junior? Like what do they call He's him? the third. So just the yeah, third. He's so, Bobby so the third. Second is junior, third is the third? <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm not calling him Bobby anymore. He's now the third. Yeah. Brings a smile to my face because he's here in the city with us. And, and crushing it. And he's doing great. Yeah. Oh, he, my God. Yeah. Like watching, watching his drive and like seeing the amount of work that he's doing and just knowing what it takes to do what he's doing, it, it excites me. Yeah. yeah and great. like, yeah, I'm 38, he's what, 25, 24? Yeah, something like that. And like seeing a kid like that as motivated in this industry and going through the motions and I'm assuming not trying to jump steps and just literally doing everything and putting in the work, yeah. again, it's motivating. Yeah, he definitely, is carrying the torch for us. Um, I have a son and a daughter, you know, they're 14 and 12 right now, but Bobby has uh, far exceeded, you know, what our <laughs> expectations were. And, uh, his father is highly successful, white collar. So the fact that I'm able to work in my industry and collaborate with my nephew, running into him at walkthroughs and stuff like that has really made a, it's been great. Uh, it's awesome. Yeah. yeah, I'm glad that you guys got to meet as well. Hell yeah, <clears throat> I'm excited to like watch his growth throughout yeah. his throughout his career yeah so i mean as a youngster my grandfather had me carrying cement blocks uh you know i went to construction school in high school which was very advantageous for me i learned how to read blueprints in ninth tenth eleventh twelfth grade oh now we're talking when i said let's bring it where did it all begin you started with the club life that's not where it began it yeah. began when you were single digits teenager i mean uh you know seventh grade they put me in catholic school because i was kind of uh class clown i think i had adhd but no one knew what that was back then <laughs> Uh, and then, you know, uh, trade school was a great fit. You know, I learned how to work with my hands and right away I was talented. I was a, a bricklayer 
and I competed in the state competitions, went to the nationals. I mean, I, I was talented in that, but it was nationals. A, yeah. For, uh, the VICA, the Voca vocational industrial clubs of America. So as a trade school member, you get to compete in your, in your trade. And I was very fast and accurate and stuff. So the problem was once I got out of high school, I got recruited by a company, Alpine Masonry Corporation, and I was building houses in Alpine and they had me up on the scaffold at 18 years old and I had to lay 200 bricks an hour. So, uh, my fingers were bleeding at night. I would come home and I would just think I can't do this for the rest of my life. That led me to want to go to college. Uh, West Virginia accepted me, which was great. Four years of communications training. Um, you know, I always had construction in my, my crosshairs, yeah. I guess. I just didn't know when it was going to happen. I'm seeing, I, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing all the dots connecting. Yeah. You got the skill set and then you kind of put it on the back burner and then you learned and this is how you became a business owner and entrepreneur because you got the skill set. Then you went to college and you already were charismatic, but you elevated your networking game, elevated your communication skills. And then you took that moved back to New York City, started working in working in the clubs, elevating your network there. And now, I mean, you got homies that are uh I'm not even gonna say you have celebrity homies. Yeah, you got some good friends of yours, and I'm like, that's fucking awesome. <laughs> We're like your close friends. I've been lucky. I've been fortunate. Um, you know, I grew up in this neighborhood. You know, I, I'm from basically born in Jersey City. I grew up in Cliffside Park, so we used to go to the city when we were young. Uh, you know, I want my kids to hear this, but we used to take the bus to the city when we were 13. So you know, that's but back then that was it was okay. It was yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. So the the, the Lower West Side, Chelsea, and all that. That was my neighborhood. I'm still there. If anything, today. I think it might be more okay now. <laughs> yeah. And maybe you don't want your kids doing that, but like, I think it's more okay now because now your kids have a smartphone and you could literally FaceTime at any, at any right. point. I used to take, because growing up in Queens, I would take the Q32, no, Q32. Regardless, I would yeah. take the bus to the city at ages 12, 13, 14, hang with family here who was a year older than me. And these city kids, they grow up a lot quicker than kids outside the city. Oh, yeah. And I don't know, maybe I had a cell phone by like 13. But like, you know, Snake and like 10, 10 numbers in there saved. That's about it. Yeah. Nowadays, you could really keep, keep more of a track on it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, looking at it from where I was then, um, you know, the, and I make the statement often, you know, I'm a product of the mean streets of New York because I learned how to get around here. And, you know, my club years, which was a 15 year run, um, you know, I had 150 people working underneath me when I was at Crowbar. So management was a was a top priority. Was Crowbar after Sound Factory or at the same time? Uh, I, I, you know, I worked at Sound Factory for two years. I was fortunate enough to meet artist Danny Teneglia. Um, he just came by the club one night. I was trying to book him. I remember clearly trying to reach out to him to get his attention and he wasn't they weren't having it back then. How do you get someone's attention? Uh, you reach out to them, you call them, you send them letters, whatever it took. This is like, you know, email was an early, this was early stages of email. We're talking like 99. Right. Um, so that's why I'm saying, because nowadays there's, you can yeah. tweet at them, DM, yada, yada, right, right. tag them in a post or do the call or the email. Then it was much harder. Yeah. I was going to the record labels. I was going to the booking agents and stuff and they weren't interested in talking, which is respect. I look back at it today, but I ended up making friends with Danny. Um, and then shortly after that, I presented something big, a big uh, idea to the owner of the Sound Factory <clears throat> to take him global, to create a website and a clothing line and a record label and have an actual studio inside the club where the DJs could... For Danny. This was for the Sound Factory. Oh, got it. I had become friends with Danny, but now I was trying to take Sound Factory global. And when I presented this idea to the owner, he fired me. He said, the Sound Factory is going to be an after hours club. It's on 46th Street. It's not going anywhere in the world. It's staying right here and you're fired. So I walked out that day. I called Danny and said, you're not going to believe this. I just got fired. Richard fired me. And he said, great, come work for me. So at that moment, it was the year 2000. Uh, Danny was playing downtown Miami. It was the first year of club space. There was never an after hours in Miami at all. This was the first year of 24 hour liquor licenses. I had this incredible experience getting to know Danny in that event. And then from that point on, it was history. Uh, I, I became uh, one of his key personnel. I worked at the club vinyl with him, but then he took me on as his tour manager for four years. Oh man, I can't even tell you this experience that was. I got to visualize. My head is 
spinning right I now. Mean, it was unbelievable. I got to go to Buenos Aires and Montreal and, you know, spend the summers in Ibiza. And it was just to see all that activity coming off of the Sound Factory in Twilo and being a part of Danny's uh, ride. He was, at the time, the DJ's DJ. He was revered. In the, as one of the top DJs in the uh, world. Yeah, he's like, I mean, still he, to this day. I was gonna say you could give him like you know, uh, Rushmore goat status. Yeah, he's he's living legend. I was there during his years when he had it was formulating all of his top number one charted hits, and I got to carry his records and set up his DJ booth and you know deal with the the fun financing of the gigs and stuff and uh, run with the promoters and uh, the memories I have from that. But I also he was a perfectionist. So I got to learn how Danny did his thing and what elevated him as a DJ and all those skills that I, I have to give him credit. He's one of my mentors and one, still one of my best friends. And these were all skills that you were then able to use to hone in on your skill now as a contractor. I actually, when Danny and I, I you know, at a certain point in time, the fairy tale comes to an end. I just said, I can't really do this anymore. The tour manager thing was just beating me up. You know, it was constant nights and days and weekends. Um, I was kind of retiring from dance music, and that's when I got the call from Crowbar. They said, we're taking over this space on 28th Street, you gotta come and see it. Now I had made friends with the Crowbar owners from Miami, because Danny had played in the club once there with them, and uh, the owner, Kenny, said, baby, you gotta come and see this place, I'm not, I'm not taking no for an answer. So I went, I looked at it, I said, how can I pass up this opportunity? So that's when Crowbar was created in 2004. Um, they gave me the position as a director of the club. Wow. Music director, whatever you want to call it. I was responsible for the events, the programming, the main floor, the lights, the sound, the promoters, you know, the front door experience. Uh, Do you remember the first event that you were in charge of at Crowbar when it opened? Um, I certainly do. I mean, New Year's Eve was a blowout, you know. Who'd you book? Uh, New, Year New Year's Eve was just in-house, uh, pretty much everything that happened there. Victor Calder Calderon played after hours. It was just the most unbelievable experience. It was 7,000 people. We blew the doors off the place. Um, but then they, were, they had a program in mind for the first eight weeks, which kind of basically failed out of the gate. So I had taken a back seat. Do you remember those. why it failed? It just, New York City opened up with a bang on the New Year's Eve, the first week of the club, and then they didn't really have a backup plan. Um, so I kind of stayed in the background at the time, and it wasn't until they presented the Big DJ Theory, which came in in February of that year. Yeah. Okay, so... Big DJ Theory being... They just offered me the reins and said, who can we get here quick? We need to fill this place. So Steve Lawler, Deep Dish, Roger Sanchez, if I remember correctly, those were the first couple DJs that came in, and immediately the club took off. Um, and then it kind of segued into the months of May and June. Uh, Dave Waxman was our resident DJ on Saturday nights. And then they gave us the opportunity to do DJ Boris in, if I remember, it was the middle of June. And uh, I took what I learned at Sound Factory and the email list that I had accumulated back then with my partner in crime at the time, Mike Whitmore. And we sent out a 30,000 name mailer, which was big back then. That's still big now. With Boris's name on it. And we blew up that Saturday night bigger than ever. Uh, Boris was our biggest resident, I would say, probably to date. Um, our Saturday nights were super strong. We had Victor Calderon uh, once a month. We had Roger Sanchez once a month. We had Danny Teneglia probably three times a year. So our Saturday night was over the top. Our production was next level. Uh, I took a lot of the carpentry skills that I had. That was going to be my next question. Yeah. Where, where, where does this now start to mold in? Uh, we started building sets, you know, uh, I had great relationships with Cesar Galindo. What hand did you have into building sets? I was the director of the club, so I got to do what I kind of formulated with the set directors. And I mentioned Cesar because still to this day, he's one of my very close friends. He's an amazing designer. Uh, we had Jorge also did the dancers and worked out all of our, you know, interiors. So I build them Halloween sets. I built them, you know, we did a spider web throughout the whole club, you know, they said we want to hang, you know, stretch fabric throughout the whole place. Now, what's your, what, what does your compensation look like during all this? Like Crowbar wants to bring you in as a, as a director. Are they offering you a salary? Is it a salary plus commission? How'd that uh, work? It was straight salary back then. Uh, we didn't really get an opportunity to make commissions. We did our own private events that were off site, kind of parlaying our, you know, our 
involvement in the weeklies. Mm-hmm. But I got to meet all the celebrities there. You know, I was friends with Alessandro Ambrosio. Puffy was a regular for us. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on. Sports figures, uh, you know, Derek Jeter was in the club all the time. I, I could just remember all of them coming through the back door and stuff. And I got to meet them and say hi and bring them to the tables and stuff. So that's kind of where I got my foundation for the construction industry. Um, Four years later, Crowbar ownership started fighting. I was pretty tired at that point, you know, thinking that my retirement was in 2004. So by 08, um, I had fallen in love with uh, my now wife of 15 years, cocktail waitress, who used to run the VIP. And we decided together that we were gonna get out of the business. And we did. So- Did you leave with a plan? (sighs) Just took a big leap of faith into construction. Uh, I drove a Bronco, which I still have today. I remember a sheetrock hanging out the back of the Bronco. A couple friends of mine asked me to renovate their apartments. Um, took a shot on me being who I was, and that's where it all started, you know. And what was the first name of the company? It was Streamline. You were Streamline right off the bat. Yeah, I had a guest list at Twilo back in 1996, and it was the Streamline guest list. And I love that. Love name. that. Yeah, and then you know it's crazy. The story unfolds years later. Um, I reach out to a great friend of mine in California who was my guest list partner at the time, Christos Klapsis. And he tells me that he started a construction company in LA and he named it Streamline. <laughs> so the name was that good. Uh, yeah. So now Do you remember why you called it Streamline? I, is it cause like, you know, it isn't the name and when you're getting into a club, the Streamline. Yeah. We easy, the, easy access. Yeah. We used a lot of that mentality back then. Uh, Streamline actually was called Streamline Communications. I came out of college with a communications degree and I formulated a, like sort of an agency for get on the guest list, book the DJ, you know, manage the artists. So I was doing a lot of that at a young age. So Streamline Communications was the company. So Streamline Corp was my first name for the construction business. Um, Today, we're Streamline USA. Um, I'd say about six years after starting Streamline Corp, the company was growing at such an exponential rate. I think I was growing at three to 400% a year. So what was the catalyst for this three to 400% growth every year? Every year, you know, my first year, if I remember the numbers correctly, I did 300,000 in sales my first year, 800,000 the second year, 3.1 million the third year, 6 million the fourth year. By the time it was done, I was up to 8.5 million. Uh, I was managing about 50 people by myself, writing checks, you know, out of the van. I had one girl in the office. Um, I had created a mill workshop at the time. Man, the story was just, I mean, just growing at that rate was just insane. In this amount of time, was there any moment or what was the moment that you were like, this is too much, my head's going to explode, maybe I should find something else to do? Yeah, I tell you, there was a moment that I felt that when I was in the club business where I just, you know, the nights led into the mornings. I had things going on that was six months out, things that had to be done that very minute. And when you feel the weight of the world on your shoulders and you want to be able to run from it, you can't uh, when you're managing a club that does 3,000 people a week. Uh, When you're in a construction business and you have 10 projects going on all over the city, restaurants that are due to, to finish, you know, new projects that are kicking off, fires burning over here. I mean, I had to do it all. I remember saying to myself, I don't think I can do this anymore. I went to my wife, I said, I can't do this anymore. And I, she said to me, well, why don't you find a partner? And like, literally my phone rang like the next day and it was one of my competitors who I bid against on jobs, who I used to see at the building supply shop where we used to buy from the same vendors. We had the same flooring guy, so we knew each other. Uh, It was kind of funny because, you know, we were kind of built the same way. We had nightlife background and stuff. Liam Trainer was his name. And uh, I remember thinking to myself, can I be partners with this guy? You know, uh, it took so long to build this brand. And I was thinking, I'm going to let a fox into the hen house here. Like, I got to be crazy. But then I thought to myself, but I'm getting out of the business anyway. So let's see how it goes. So we sat down, we had a great meeting. Uh, I remember really liking Liam a lot as a person. He was a hard hitter, similar to me. You know, we didn't take shit from anybody. So we started Streamline. And, uh, you know, they basically branded And that's me. when it went from Streamline Corps to Streamline USA. Streamline USA, yeah. Streamline Corp was a company that had ran off the rails. I remember having a ton of debt. 
needing to figure out how to, you know, dig myself out of this. And, you know, luckily the world of business is set up so you could kind of segue into a new business. I kept running Streamline Corp at the same time Streamline USA started. Uh, we had a third partner. Um, I'll leave his name out of this uh, for now, but he was my mill worker at the time and he did beautiful work. So it helped me make me make my company what it was at the time. It was the finishing touches on all my residential work. Liam was a commercial builder. He was building bars and restaurants and some of them, to name a few, SDK, Buddha Bar, like he was accomplished. Why is that third partner no longer? Um, I, you know, being a mill worker, he was built in, you know, his business was built in a very insulated uh, type of environment where he could control the mill work, bring it out and be paid. And as a general contractor, you are constantly, your money is constantly changing hands. You're busy putting, starting jobs up. You're trying to finish jobs. You got punch lists going on. So um, he just wasn't really used to that. And our company went from me doing 8 million to our first year of doing 16 million. So it basically, the output was just astronomical. <laughs> they basically turned me loose as a sales rep for the company. Good, you had the skill set for it. And I knew everything about the company from conception, yeah, this from This was driving. years overdue. Yeah, and um, you know, knowing how to talk to talk in the game and how to you know, line up the business was really my specialty. Liam wanted to be the operator. He is our chief operator today. He wanted to build the jobs. He didn't want to deal with sales. He didn't want to deal with the warm up part of estimating and dealing with the projects. So uh, it was a great partnership. Um, Oren exited the company, I think it was about three and a half years after we started it. At that time, we were up to $23 million a year in sales. Um, you know, we were working with the biggest owners reps, the biggest brands, Grand Old Opry, uh, Kith. You know, we're you, what, uh, what work did you do with Kith? Uh, we built their, their flagship stores. We built their corporate offices. Uh, Sam Ben Abraham, who's their, one of the founders with Ronnie Feig, he was the big, the muscle behind the business. Ronnie was the designer. I had built uh, Atrium for Sam. I built his corporate offices. I did work in his apartments, his townhouse. So um, those relationships I cultivated from the club. So I knew Sam back when I was getting him in the back door at Crowbar and seeing him in Miami. And you know that's kind of what formulated those, a lot of those relationships. Would you say that is the most work you've gotten from one of your relationships? I would have to give a lot of that credit to Sam. Sam put me on the map as a youngster. Um, I said youngster, I was already 40 years old, but uh, Sam- That makes me feel good that you just said that. Yeah, in, my, in our business, you have to have tenure, otherwise people don't take you seriously. You, know, you can't be a 28 year old talking about how great of a job you're gonna do for somebody, so. Fair enough, and you also, yeah. but the, the relationships, the networking, that is, that, that is the crux of what it sounds like got you started and has, been the fuel on the fire. It's been huge. Um, back in the club business, you know, I met Dean Winters. I have to say, he's he's one of my best friends today. He's one of the biggest influences in my life. Uh, he opened up tremendous doors for me. He introduced me to you know Chris Maloney, Tom Fontana, Lee Turgeson. Um, you know, uh, I can't say enough good things about Dean. He's just such a solid partner and friend of mine. I built his his Tribeca townhouse for him and his two thousand square foot roof deck, which is. Awesome. Unbelievable. Just yeah. unbelievable to be able to still be. Yeah, uh, that's one of the coolest rooftops I've, uh, one of the coolest rooftops. And as a real estate broker of 15 years, I see a lot. Yeah. I see a lot between here, between Miami, and his rooftop is sick. It's unbelievable. Yeah, he spent three years looking for it. Uh, I can't tell you how many showings we went to together looking for just the right thing. Uh, Dean takes up a portion of that neighborhood. Um, I, you know, to this day, we're able to play giant JBL speakers on the roof. <laughs> We got a, you know, a, a gas fire pit. We have nano doors that open up yeah, the whole world. Sick. It's, you know, the, the Freedom Tower is looking over our shoulder up there. Yeah, so it's, it's really a great accomplishment to Dean's uh, history in acting. And uh, yeah, I'm, I was fortunate enough to be able to build that apartment for him. So yeah, that's a big part of it. And I'm glad that we had a chance to recognize that. Off topic for a second, uh, where do you put Oz in best shows of all time? You know, I was hooked on Oz, so. Um, I could watch it over and over again. So with Oz, after we finished it, that was probably the number one show that I wish that I could like Men in Black myself and like just forget it, so I could start it over and everything so cool. could be fresh. Yeah, all the players that were oh there, my god, those youngsters. Yeah. Uh, so when we when uh, when you posted the the that Zoe, yeah, the new the the YouTube the, little, yeah. the YouTube short that they did, yeah. 
Um, I went and I looked on IMDb to look at Oz and like see how long ago it was. And you just scroll forever. The amount of successful act, the amount of talent that was on that show was crazy. And then, you know, Tom Fontana is one of my clients as well. Uh, we got to refinish his library. He lives in the, the original New York library. Oh, wow. I mean, this guy, Where is that? I can't say enough great things about him. It's on the corner of 13th and 8th. Uh, it's an eclectic building. Obviously, Gangs of New York was going on back then. And Tom lives there, and the library is his library. Um, I, we were able to refinish his floors, and you know, we've done random projects throughout the building, replaces HVAC, but uh, Tom is a, is a family member to me, and just being able to know him on a personal level, the brain of the, the thoughts that came out on paper for him to write those stories, stuff like that, it's, yeah, this it gives me goosebumps thinking yeah, about that's the, the team, yeah. Why do, uh, what do the next six months look like for Streamline? So we're, we're engaged in some pretty monster jobs right now. Um, I know. On Chante Brands, uh, thankfully I got introduced to that through a very close friend of mine, Michael Tresini, who's the designer. That's 96,000 square feet, 12 floors are renovating on Madison, as I mentioned. We have Magic Mike Live, um, which is the movie with Channing Tatum, actually is a theatrical performance that started in Vegas in the Hard Rock. It grew to such a monstrous size that it's, you know, I don't know, it's grossed over 300 million or something. So the same brand that owns it in Vegas, because I see that they have celebrities that go and they do Vegas, I don't know if it's residencies, but you'll have famous people, uh, like Vinny from, uh, Vinny yeah. from Jersey Shore. Uh, he's just the one that was on it a few months ago when I was in Vegas. I didn't go to Magic Mike. Yeah. Uh, but you see the posters for it. Right. Do you know those are the same people and are they going to be doing the same concept here? So Channing Tatum actually is the owner. Um, so that's a great thing, great foundation. For so Channing York. Tatum is the owner of actual Magic Mike production. Yeah. I think I have some partners in there too, but he is the face and he is the founding father of it, essentially. Um, we, as a construction company, have to adapt to all of our clients um, Magic Mike has an incredible staff. The people that I've been working with, Don Gilmore, uh, Vincent Marini, they're just awesome people. The design team, or Arda, um, Rachel O'Toole, th this, this staff is at an elevated level. We have to be qualified to work with them. Uh, Joey Morrissey, who is the guy who wrote the book on New York City promotions and nightlife, I have to give all the credit to him. I've known him for over 30 years. Joey gave me the opportunity to work with M2 which is their club brand, which is in Miami. Uh, they're coming to New York to do the China Club. They partnered with Magic Mike Live, um, and Magic Mike is now taking the top of the building off and going up three floors. So they have a stadium seating in the round um, with, it's just an unbelievable setup, basically, coming this way. Wow, that's, uh, I mean, they're gonna be, sounds like they're gonna have a lot of catching up to do in terms of bills to pay, but once they're open, I mean, it's cash a, cow. Magic Mike is in London. They're in New York. They're tremendous operators. Uh, I can't say enough good things about them. I have not seen the show, only the movies. Mm -hmm. I'm going to Vegas at uh, the end of May to check it out just so I can get a feel for what they do. Good. But what we're doing in Times Square is going to rewrite the book of amazing. Uh, Magic Mike is going to be the beginning of the night, the performances, and then it's going to transition into M2 Nightclub. Afterwards, that'll be the first of its kind. And all of this is just everything coming full circle with your skill sets from decade and decade and decade and decade. Just all this experience, just and all your all your relationships are just like compounding into these awesome projects. And you got a lot of years left. Yeah, you I probably so. got another 20, 30 years in this business. Yeah, I hope. I mean, uh, you know, I'd like to set my sights on just doing really great projects now. Yeah. Um, we're trying to shy away from things that cause headaches. You know, we're managing right now. We probably have $20 million in volume going on in this town. So is this the same thing in your business? Now, Michael Zenreich, who introduced us, he told me once there's 99% of your work takes about 1% of your time. And then there's that 1%, that headache project that takes up 99% of your time. Yeah, it's uh, construction, you know, is all based on the plans in New York. You can wing it in the outer boroughs uh, when you don't have tremendous overhead, but, you know, we have a midtown office. 
our company has 55 people working, about 25 in the office, you know, 30 or so carpenters in the field. The plans are not right. It causes a lot of turbulence in the job. So what Michael MZA Architecture is referring to is that turbulence. That turbulence causes waves with the clients. It causes waves with uh, the finishes, the execution. Uh, you know, right now we're standing in a 7,800 square foot townhouse. You can just imagine how many bells and whistles this place has. Um, it's an ongoing process. 96,000 square feet in the showroom for Enchante. Magic Mike Live is going to be about 30,000 square feet with catwalks and you know movers, uh, motors and movers throughout. You know, um, having different divisions, having different staff. You know, we play a role, Liam and I, in kind of day-to-day -day operations, but we also mentor our staff and we have to train people and people come and go. So we also have to do that. So we wear, we wear many hats. At the same time, we're managing these contracts from start to finish. And, um, you know, I can't say it's easy, uh, but the training that both Liam and I have, um, he's definitely a, a much more technical builder, blows me away with his technical knowledge. Uh, when we're building restaurants, he's, you know, he's figuring out systems that the engineers can't figure out. Uh, I'm more of the, um, kind of the, char the charisma, I want to say, the kind of... Uh, yeah, it's, I know. mean, in this, in this interview, it's been apparent every year. Uh, yeah, I'm not saying Liam doesn't have charisma. No, no, no but, but like everything you know. you've done since like the 80s, 90s, 2000s, like everything is predicated on your personality. Yeah, thank you. Um, I had an owner's rep tell me one time that he's never met anybody with as much finesse as me. Um, I, I took that as a tremendous compliment because he saw my ability to be able to deal with the clients, deal with the contractors, deal with the guys who are the laborers on the field, and to be able to kind of be a part of all their worlds. Uh, I could sit at the dinner table with like, you know, the Prince of Qatar, and then you know, be working with my team who's lugging garbage and sweeping the floors. And, and I try to, you know, command respect at all levels. Well, when I was introduced to you, and I'll look at the camera and say this, I was introduced to Eric and I was told that Eric Hortense from Streamline USA is the most trustworthy contractor in the business and one of the most trustworthy people you'll ever meet. And that was from someone that I've known for 30 years of my life. That's what he said to me. And for him being in the business for 40 years, to say that about you is godly. That's a tremendous compliment. Um, I have the utmost respect for Michael Zenreich. Uh, he and what he's done in his 40 year tenure as an architect in this town, I mean, he manages over 200 buildings. That just says it alone. Uh, he's also an artist. We work together, we're on three projects right now. Um, I like to think that we'll stay together till whenever he's retired or ha passes his torch uh, to people that are, you know, I have utmost respect for people in his business, Michael Rosani. Um, I, I, I myself am in a position today to think about how we work, and we probably work with five or six different architects, not 36. Yeah. So we keep those guys happy. They, in turn, work with us, bringing their amazing projects. I sometimes get a chance to recommend jobs. When I do, it's usually to one of those five or six. That's what's up. Yeah, yeah. It's been great getting to know you too, Steve. I mean, honestly, I've we met uh, off, you know, out of nowhere. It was an odd place to actually get a chance to meet you. But hearing who you were and what you did, um, I fully support you and, and your mission. Uh, I love what you're about. I love the way you uh, materialize things in social media, and um, I'm really happy to be on your team. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I mean. Most of the things you just mentioned are things that I do because I, I love them. And like, well, real estate is my job and it's my day to day. A lot of these other things I do are their, their hobbies. And uh, not that real estate makes me insane, but they make me, these other things make me sane because I, I'm happy to do them. I'm happy to create. Uh, how important is it for you, is you, how important is it for you to be able to disconnect and really focus on your hobbies and not just on managing 50, 60 plus people on a weekly basis? Yeah, I mean, that's uh, when they gave me the job of being the CEO, um, that took a lot of the heat off of me because the chief operator really has to cover those operational bases. That's like nonstop. I mean, I want to think Liam probably gets a thousand emails a day. I get about 300. Um, my job is to work on future projects and get them to contract. Liam's working in the heat of what's going on in the day to day. I like to disconnect. I'm, I race motocross on the weekends. I surf, I skate, I snowboard. Um, but my racing has really 
uh, it's, it's changed my life. You know, I've been, I got on a dirt bike 10 years ago. Five years ago, I started racing. Today, I race competitively in amateur class. I get in a- Races my, weekly. Yeah, I get in my RV and I race in five different states. Um, and you just did 10 days at race camp. I went away to Club MX, which is the top training facility in the country, just to hone my skills better at 51 years old. Um, yeah, and I'm trying to, you know, get my kids into all those things. My daughter's a gymnast. My son is an you know, avid designer in, in computers and what he does. Uh, my wife is a Pilates instructor, so we have, you know, we have some athletic uh, composition, I guess, so to speak. And it's only growing. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. I'm growing younger, I guess. What, uh, <laughs> what are you reading right now, if anything? Reading? Yeah. Um, I'm actually reading a book, uh, A DJ's Dream. By Hernan Catania, uh, another very close friend of mine who I met, you know, 25 years ago. The life story of of Hernan. Um, I, I still follow the DJ thing. I saw my toe in the water, so to speak, in Costa Rica, the BPM festival. Uh, friends of mine from Toronto created this festival, moved to Costa Rica. I introduced them to the land that I love so much, and my family and friends there. Uh, the Espinar family opened up doors for me. I can't say enough good things about Costa Rica. So today, Streamline USA is going to be Streamline Costa Rica. Uh, we have some development properties that we're working on with some with an investment group here in the city. If BPM stays and continues to grow the way it has over the last five years, we have our foothold in the bringing of dance music to that region. And I'm kind of the ambassador to that. Kind of. Cool. No, you are the ambassador yeah. to that. <laughs> you are the ambassador to that. And you spend weeks at a time down in Costa Rica, literally build, d building, designing, designing, building. Wait, let me go surf. Wait, let me go ride motocross. Yeah. Then go surf again. Then go build some more. That's the life. Yeah, it's cool. Uh, I have a partner in crime, Michelangelo Pinto. Uh, he's been one of my best friends for about 20 something years as well. He's helped me to bring all this stuff to life. Um, and we're you know now working together with a team here in New Jersey um, that could really open up some monstrous doors. Uh, my our friend Owen and Neil, um, we'll see where this goes. But you know we have our sights set on a couple of development sites to be able to build uh, villas. Amen. And yeah. I know that it's only going to grow. This is sick. Yeah. I mean, I knew I knew half of this, or not most of the, all that part. But just hearing you say it and talk about it, like after hearing about how you got here. Is that much more energizing? Yeah, it's cool. It's it's. Uh, I'm looking. You know, I'm 51. I'm looking at my next 10 years pretty clearly. I think right now at this point, um, which is nice. What's one book you would recommend to anybody? Uh, well, I mean, there's been so many different books. You know, over the years, inspirational books. I mean, you know, the. the Trump book, The Art of the Deal, um, kind of articulates, you know, how to formulate your posturing when it comes down to working in the city. Um, you know, I, I don't like the idea of like, you know, negotiating the balance when it comes to co construction. That's that's one negative side to things. But in putting the business side together of what I think the country is built on from a, a deal mechanism, I think that it's important to think long term. You know, it's really important to think long term when it comes Amen. Down to. Amen. I read that a few years ago. Fantastic. Yeah. Art yeah. of the deal is great. Yeah, I'm not a huge Trump fan when it comes to the person behind it, but I think that the um, the formulation of what business is all about when it comes to putting deals together. Yeah, I mean, really this book was before politics. Yeah, yeah, back, right. Exactly. Back, back before half the country hated him. Yeah. And you know, he was just a businessman. Yeah, I, I like what he stands for as far as uh, patriotism and the way Absolutely. that America needs uh, you know guidance and things like that. But um, from a from a construction standpoint, our city was built on different things. I'm not an out of the ground builder. I'm an interior renovator. Our company, Liam and I, that we built is more about building the inside of the buildings than the outside. Um, and, and Trump was a you know he was an out of the ground builder. So I don't do what he does. Or did, rather. Got it. Yeah. Um, before I let you go, give me one word for anyone trying to make it. You gotta stay with it. Uh, perseverance is really uh, a key element here. I took a lot of falls. I, I took a lot of bumps and bruises along the way. Uh, a lot of people helped me. Um, my father was a big helper. He lent me money when I needed it to make payroll. Uh, I had a few you know, long, short-term loans that I had to take out to just be able to keep going. But uh, staying with it is really a big thing. You got to live your dream. You got to make sure that you're having fun along the way. And I think 
my biggest fears, I put them aside and I, and I attacked it. Yeah, man. Eric Hortense, Streamline USA. He just, he, he's the best. He, he's, he's the best. He, if, if you if you maybe re-listen to this episode again, and you'll just see why I love Eric so much. I talk to him a few times a week, and I try and give him as much work as I can, even though uh, he's overloaded, and I'm just, I just throw it at him. Thanks Thank a lot, you. Steve, man. I appreciate you bringing me on. Oh, yeah. come here. Bunny too, girl.